Good morning. I'm Jan Cope, Provost of the Cathedral, and it's my joy to welcome you to our service this morning on Monday, September 28th from St. Mary's Chapel. Let us pray. Lord God, you've brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture for today is taken from the book of Job, the first chapter beginning at the sixth verse. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, all that he has is in your power. Only do not stretch out your hand against him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell on them and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said the Chaldeans formed three columns, made a raid on the camels and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came across the desert, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. Well, after that cheery passage, you may wonder why I selected it, because of course there were other options. I think when Many people are asked about the book of Job, and what do you know about the book of Job? People tend to go to the moniker, the patience of Job, that a person has the patience of Job. Well, I can assure you, he did until the end of that verse, but that's just a portion of the first chapter. The book of Job goes on for 42 chapters. And if whoever came up with the moniker had read through the rest of the book of Job, Job would not be remembered by that moniker. Who would be with that sort of unspeakable calamity? 
I lift up the book of Job because I think it has much to teach us, to tell us about suffering and how we navigate suffering. It lifts up for us one of the quintessential questions in life and certainly one that's been asked so many times during this pandemic. Why? Why is there evil and suffering in the world? The fancy theological term for that is theodicy. And it basically is this. If we believe that God is good and God is just and God is all powerful, why is there suffering and evil in the world? Well, I can assure you in three minutes, I'm not going to have any kind of an answer for why that satisfies. If I had 300 years, I wouldn't have an answer that satisfies. But there's much in the book of Job to commend for our deepening study and the things that we can take from it. Most scholars would say that the book of Job is the finest scripture of the wisdom tradition in Hebrew scriptures and in Christian scriptures. And many of you may remember the famous book by Rabbi Kushner, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. It's the conundrum of the wisdom tradition that is supposed to be that the righteous prosper and the wicked perish. But we know that's not the way the world works. Good people suffer. Good people experience evil in the world, as to whomever we would characterize as bad people or wicked people. Part of what I think the book of Job lifts up for us is a different way of looking at the power of God. In Kushner's book, he puts three principles, three tenets in tension. God is good and just. God is powerful and Job is righteous. We know from scripture and you heard in the passage from the first chapter that God says there's no one like Job on earth, that he's a just man, he is a righteous man. So you can't hold up those three things simultaneously. We know God is good. We know God is powerful. But what if God exercises God's power in a different way. What if God doesn't exercise God's power to rescue or to punish or to reward? What if God has us in the world vulnerable? Human beings who are vulnerable, each one of whom, however, is created in the image of God and has the gift of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to do that which God has called us to do. When we look at the theology of the cross, Jesus, fully human, fully divine, on the cross, knows about suffering and knows about evil. I would submit to you that God is omnipresent in our suffering. God calls upon us who are inextricably interconnected one with another to be the hands, the feet, and the heart of Christ. I know from the emails and the notes that you have sent to me, to the dean, and to the colleagues, 
of the cathedral that so many of you are being that image of God in the hands, in the heart, in the feet of Christ within your own communities, being there with those who are suffering. That is the power of God that abides in each one of us. So in answer to the question, where is God in the midst of suffering? I invite you to look within and look around you and you will see God active in the world, in you and in those around you. And for that, we can say, thanks be to God. And now let us pray in the words our Savior Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O God, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, we pray for all those affected by the coronavirus around the world, for the leaders of the nations, that they may work together for the common good, give public health and government officials the strength and will to act with wisdom and compassion in service to all. Remove the presence of fear and anxiety from our hearts and heal all those who are sick with the virus. Give skill, sympathy, and resilience to all who are caring for the sick and your wisdom to those searching for a cure. Strengthen them with your spirit that through their work many will be restored to health. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. O God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and always. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh,